Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a new initiative from the um, EDU, the Educational Development Unit, here at the Institute for European Studies. Um, formerly, we had a variety of in-house training sessions, uh, one-day training sessions um, on a variety um, of different topics. And it occurred to us that with the advent of new technology, uh, such as webinars um, and uh, streaming live opportunities, we could perhaps compress um, uh, the ability to teach or to train on comprehensive ideas of the decision making in the European Union um, and large actors like um, the Commission and the Council and the Parliament uh, into handy dandy webinars. So that is the rationale behind uh, Decoding the EU. Um, and the Decoding the EU course is a four part course um, which is going to take place every Wednesday uh, during the month of May. This is the first one. Um, and as you'll see at the end, uh, the next three take place on a weekly basis. So you just need to free up your Wednesday, have your computer, have your lunch, and we will uh, we will take it from there. Here you go. 16th of May, next week, the Council, followed by the Parliament on the 23rd. And then, because it's such a broad topic, um, which touches on everything we're going to be speaking on today, uh, the EU decision-making process. There's three or four different uh, aspects to that, depending on the institution you're looking at. So we're going to certainly need a full webinar dedicated to that. Um, what I'm going to do now um, is uh, let you know the, the structure of the webinar, um, and I will give you just a, a quick snapshot of the Eurospeak. I, I hope that uh, Alexander and I don't drift too much into the use of acronyms, but it is a difficult task because uh, so many of the words and terms um, in the European Union do get reduced uh, to acronyms and initials. Um, the ones I think that we're going to see the most of today are MS, of course, for the member states, QMV, Qualified Majority Voting, EP, European Parliament, and probably towards the end when we get into the foreign affairs relations of the Commission, um, common foreign and security policy, but we'll, we'll tackle that um, a little bit later. So at this point, um, the European Commission is going to be the, the focal point for today's um, lecture. I have to say that in, in an hour, it's virtually impossible to get the, all of the history uh, and the, the myriad complexities of what is one of the world's largest uh, supranational entities and most complex um, inter-institutional um, dynamics, if you like, uh, into uh, a variety of slides without A, either boring myself or B, everybody else. So what we've taken, I think, are the, the, the hot points, if you like, um, of what continues to be the, the daily working reality of the European Commission, um, with a, a few little working snapshots um, of history to begin with. Um, a variety of the slides I think I'll certainly I'll touch on, but I don't necessarily need to go through uh, in great detail. But I think it's prescient to remember that the Commission has been around for quite a while now, more than half a century, um, and that it has grown and developed in an extraordinary way um, from a, a, an original nine-member high authority under Jean Monnet um, to uh, a growing sense um, of supranational um, authority and administration, um, specifically geared to oversee the European coal and steel community. So the Commission is at the very beating heart of what the European community has been, first as a peacemaking effort after the Second World War, um, then as a sort of inter-institutional series um, of dynamics and structures uh, based largely on industry and market. But now these days, uh, given its extraordinary um, spread of policy um, areas, as, as we'll see at the end, um, it engages with, with much more than market, but society, um, key leading areas of, of climate change and also foreign policy. The word commission, of course, uh, translated into different languages means different uh, things. Uh, originally in the 1950s, uh, the idea was that commission meant slightly less uh, than the high authority, and it was a sort of an attempt to, to reduce the power of the high authority by simply calling it uh, a, a commission, a small commission um, of people to denote a lesser status, particularly when compared to the council. I think what has been tremendously helpful for the commission is that its, it's first few commissioners, particularly the first one, Walter Halstein, um, were, were, were men of tremendous energy um, and vision. Um, and in, in a number of uh, cases, they sort of came from, from nowhere. They were very much uh, dark horses. And I think Walter Halstein is a good example of that. Um, he slowly put together um, European law, began to consolidate it um, in, in a way in which it began to have a serious impact on, on national legislation. And through these legislative highways and byways, you see the early commission slowly stamping its authority um, on various aspects um, of, of domestic politics and domestic legislation. Um, and of course, uh, in doing so, it, it, it got, I think, under the skin a bit of some of the, the member states, and this is most uh, particularly seen in 1965 with the empty chair crisis. 
which was triggered by a variety of differences between uh, who else, the, the, the French uh, government uh, over the British entry, uh, as well as a variety of other issues, um, including the common agricultural policy, which is still um, a, a very um, a prescient point even today with regards to the Commission. This is a crisis that was solved, but unfortunately it, it brought Halstein down, so he had to be uh, moved away. Um, but he's certainly one of the most dynamic leaders. Then I think from there you, you, you come to uh, Jacques Delors, who still I think even now seems to be held up as the archetypical great commissioner. Um, a tremendous sense of dynamism and vision, uh, a, a, and a vision I think firmly stapled to the, the economic realities and the economic potential, um, not just um, of, of, of an emerging union, but the commission I think as the technocratic heart of that as the administrative architect par excellence. So although he's known as the, father, uh, the founding father of, of the Euro, he also used the Commission, I think, as a way to break Europe out of this tremendous time of Eurosclerosis and Eurostasis. He utterly transformed a rather dispirited Brussels Commission. Um, and through his two terms from 85 to 95, um, effectively constructed the outer um, form and the inner workings of the single market moving on to very ambitious ideas of economic, monetary, and ultimately political union. And if this is all done within the European Commission, you can see that the Commission is um, an entity um, who has you know, the DNA of Europe effectively written right into it. After that, you have uh, the Santerre Commission, 1995 to 1999, continuing on um, the work of Delors and looking at um, the method of the, uh, the Amsterdam Treaty to support um, uh, various uh, fiscal um, and legislative developments um, in the European Union. Unfortunately, uh, the Santerre Commission was, was laid low. It was forced to resign. Um, in 1999, this was in fact one of my very first days in Brussels, and it, it seemed a very odd thing to, to see at the time. I always wondered whether commissions resigned on that, you know, every week, but I was glad to hear that it, that didn't happen. This was in fact the first time a commission had been forced to resign en masse, and as we'll see in a few slides, it heralds a growing development by the European Commission to hold, uh, by the European Parliament to hold the commission to account. The Amsterdam Treaty uh, widened still further the Commission's powers. They're strengthened yet again in the Nice Treaty and under uh, the, the, the Prodi Commission. The composition um, and the interworkings of the Commission are translated once again. And so finally we come up to the, the president that we have now, Jose Manuel Barroso. So he, his college effectively is divided into two eras, 2004 to 9, um, and 2010 to 2014 as well. Um, he has come uh, afoul of the European Parliament uh, a number of times with regards to the constitution um, of the, the, the college, as we'll see in, in a few slides. It's in fact the first one to be uh, reshuffled at the request of, of, the, of the European Parliament. Um, and also the, the number of uh, commissioners uh, per, per college has um, shifted, not just with an enlargement, but also as a result um, of, of, of the method of translating that uh, to formal representation. Um, Whilst the Lisbon Treaty held up uh, a variety of legislative and historical and even political developments in the European Union, Barroso effectively had to act as something of a caretaker uh, until a new commission was approved by Parliament under the Lisbon Treaty. That also had to do with the, the, the Irish ratification as well. Um, the appointments are, are not terrifically complex, but they do occur in stage-to-stage -stage, um, uh, fashion. As you can see, this is a slide that takes you um, through, the, through the appointments in a little bit more, more detail. I think what's uh, interesting, of course, is again the European Parliament acting as, as a much more uh, strict and rigorous forum um, than, it, than it had um, in, in the past. And again, this, this comes from the Amsterdam and these treaties. They confirm the de facto confirmatory power of the Parliament in appointing the Commission President uh, and the College by QMV uh, rather than consensus. Um, I think the two things that really need to, to, to be uh, borne in mind at this point, um, that the Council should take into consideration the recently held um, EP elections um, and also the idea that the candidate uh, must be elected and not merely approved by the European Parliament. I'm going to draw a halt there now and turn back to Alexandra uh, who's going to take you through the inner workings of the European uh, Parliament and when she reaches um, the end of that and it's time to turn to the impact of the Commission on Foreign affairs and vice versa, she's going to hand back to me. Thank you very much. Uh, I will go on uh, talking about um, the function, the, the, the role, the main role and the functioning of the Commission, of course also about the composition of the, the Commission. Um, here you just have a, a screenshot of basically where on the EU website you can find information about the College of Commissioners, about each commissioner in, uh, in particular, 
um, and also about their cabinets. And I will come back in a few slides to talk about what the cabinets are because they play quite an important role in the decision making process. Uh, but first of all, I would like to stress uh, uh, the following, and that's something that um, maybe it's very important for you to take away from this, uh, this session, is that when we talk about the European Commission, we have to really think of it in two different levels. So first of all, we have the political level, which is represented by the College of Commissioners, and next to it, we have the bureaucratic level, which is represented by the, the, the General Directorate, DGs, in short. And we'll talk about each of them uh, separately in, in a bit. Uh, but that's really important because normally when we hear about, when we read or hear about the Commission in the media, it is mainly about the political part, the College of Commissioners. Commissioner X or Commissioner Y has done that, has been there, has said that. <clears throat> but this is just like the, the tip of the iceberg, basically. So that's the, the political part. What lies be behind that or beneath that is the general directorate, the DGs that actually do all the work, the bureaucratic work, the, the proposals, the legislative proposals. And we're going to go a bit more into detail on how that happens within the Commission uh, um, in, uh, further on in this presentation. That's really important to remember at this point. We have the political part, the political level, and the bureaucratic level. And these two go in parallel. Uh, and the Commission refers basically to both of them. First, we're going to talk about the political part, the College of Commissioners, and of course its president, and then we'll refer back to the DGs and services. Uh, so first of all, the, the College of Commissioners, of course, is led by a president. Uh, as Amelia mentioned, there were a few um, important presidents in the last uh, uh, decades, uh, and uh, for the last basically seven or, uh, years or so, we had, uh, we had uh, Barroso as uh, president of the Commission. Uh, what is the role of the president? The president, of course, represents the Commission in dealing with the other EU institutions and also with, with external bodies, with member states, and so on. Uh, it also, he also, he or she, plays the, the guidelines um, within which the Commission works. Uh, they are, of course, laid out already in the treaty, uh, but he kind of makes sure makes sure, oversees the, uh, the way the Commission functions, the various administrative services, um, including the Secretariat, the way they function and, and uh, produce legislative proposals. Um, he also, and that's quite important, allocates the Commissioner portfolios. So as we saw before in the appointment procedure, basically the President is elected, uh, confirmed by the European Parliament, uh, and then uh, he has to basically build his team. Uh, and uh, that he does on the basis of proposals that each member state come, uh, come up with, comes up with uh, for, for their uh, commissioner nominee. Uh, and uh, he allocates various portfolios to them according to their previous experience or to their, their uh, particular uh, preferences and, and uh, so on, according to national interests sometimes. There, it, it's a bit of a of bargaining game there. Uh, but um, also he allocates the portfolios in the beginning, but he also uh, can reshuffle them throughout the, the commission time. Uh, in, and then um, the commissioners are, so you, we have at the moment one commissioner per member state, so we have 27 commissioners. Uh, of course, in the um, uh, course of preparing the, the, the constitutional treaty and then the Lisbon treaty, there was talk about reducing the number of commissioners simply because after the biggest enlargement that happened in uh, 2004 and 2007, um, the commission size well, basically, it grew from from 15 to 27. So um, it was it became a bit a bit difficult to to work in an effective manner uh, with this number. So uh, the idea was to reduce the number of commissioners, the number of portfolios, to reduce it to to basically the, the really meaningful portfolios. Because when we had uh, Romania and Bulgaria join, for example, uh, it. it it was very difficult to give these two commissioners, these two new commissioners, really meaningful portfolios. So what they got was, for example, the Romanian commissioner got the multilingualism portfolio. And one can argue and, and, and with reason that, that that was not really as, as meaningful or as important as economic or, or financial portfolios. So um, the idea was to reduce the number of portfolios, the number of commissioners, uh, but of course, uh, the member states did not really agree. And here is a bit of a contradiction because what you have to know about the Commission is that the commissioners are to be independent and not act as national representatives. So this is basically the main thing in their in their contract, so-called in in their in their statutes. Uh, and then you might wonder, so then, if they don't act in the interest of their countries, or they're not supposed to act in the interest of the countries, and here is a, a little nuance. Um, why then the member states did not want to give up their commissioner? Well, 
here the answer is, is, is kind of hidden behind, <laughs> behind the lines here. Uh, the, uh, you, you just have to see it this way. They are, they are human. Uh, they, they do come from a member state. They do come from a political party. So it is virtually impossible for them to be completely, completely neutral in their work. However, the important thing is that they should be, they are supposed to be independent and act in the interest of the European Union and not in the interest of their national members, the, the member state they represent, <clears throat> they come from. Um, the Commission, um, the College as, as a whole, uh, as Amelia mentioned already before, has to be approved by the European Parliament. Uh, and the important part in, in this sense is as a whole. So it's not every commissioner can be approved or uh, dismissed by the European Parliament, but the College as a whole. So the Parliament has to give a vote, a confidence vote, to the entire College of Commissioners. <clears throat> Now, how does that happen? Uh, and she already mentioned, she already hinted towards the fact that the European Parliament has gained quite, uh, quite a bit of power lately with the last treaties, with the latest treaties um, regarding the, the appointment of the Commission. Um, the, the European Parliament basically organizes hearings for each, um, uh, each and every commissioner nominee. So the, the committees in the European Parliament, and when we were talking two weeks about the European Parliament, we'll get back to that. Um, so the, the, the parliamentary committees that are structured according to topic, uh, they interview, they, 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 they have a hearing, they organize a hearing with, um, uh, the, commissioner, with the commissioner nominee of that specific resort. And um, he or she is kind of grilled, they're also called grillings instead of hearings, uh, because um, uh, the, the, um, uh, parliament, uh, the European Parliament members, they can be quite tough. Uh, and uh, twice, in fact, in the last uh, uh, two mandates, uh, they actually rejected one commission nominee. Um, in 2004, it was um, it was um, uh, Italian, uh, the Italian uh, nominee, and in 2009, it was the um, uh, Bulgarian nominee. And that's because the Parliament uh, didn't really find it that the, the persons appointed or nominee, uh, nominated were. Um, appropriate for the, the respective position within the Commission. Um, either they were not professionally fit for, for, the, for the job or they were simply, um, there were some issues, that there were personal conflicts of interest or, or so on that, that um, prevented them from uh, uh, possibly uh, fulfilling their job, their tasks uh, in, in, a, in a right manner. So the Parliament, uh, what did the Parliament do? Because basically, as I said, they cannot dismiss or, or say no to a specific commissioner, uh, but they hinted, they, they gave a very, very clear signal to, to Barroso, to the President-elect, that uh, he uh, should change these two candidates, uh, because, <clears throat> because otherwise uh, there is a real danger that um, uh, the Commission, the whole college, will not be approved, will, will uh, not receive the vote of confidence by the European Parliament. And guess what? Both times Barroso did give in, so it was really a strong signal, um, and they changed the two nominees that had problems in the hearings. Uh, and um, yeah, in fact, this time they, he came up with a, with a really a, a very good one of his best commissioners, is the Bulgarian one uh, that is in charge of humanitarian aid. And uh, so, yeah, he could do better, but uh, the first try was 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 uh, was not that good. So yes, that's the important thing. The European Parliament has to approve the whole college. In fact, that goes also the reverse. When there is a problem, like we've seen uh, mentioned before with the Santer Commission, um, the European Parliament can also dismiss, but again, only the entire college and not specific commissioners. So even if the fault falls with one specific commissioner, the college must resign or will receive a vote of no confidence from the Parliament as a college. So that that is the the the, the backside of it. Um, very linked to that, and actually something that you should remember uh, is that the collegiality principle. So the, the the commission actually functions according to the collegiality principle. Decisions, you see, already from the appointment moment, the the um, uh, parliament has to approve it as a college, so not separately, not as specific commissioners, um, and uh, it also takes all the decisions as a college. So. It's not the Commissioner X or Commissioner Y took a specific decision or signed a specific legislative proposal. It's the, coll the College of Commissioners that does that. That always has to be in the back of your mind when you hear about the College or the Commission. Because usually it's portrayed like that, that Commissioner Y, because it was in his or her topic, uh, took that decision. No, it's, it's always the College. And if we really look in depth, probably we won't get to in that much depth in, in, in this lecture, but if you look into in depth how the Commissioners actually take the, the internally their decisions, uh, it can be done um, either by discussing it in the oral procedure 
but that's only for the very controversial issues. Most of the time it can be done in the written procedure or, or in the delegation procedure and then one commissioner can approve, can, can adopt a legislative proposal for all of them on behalf of all of them just because of this collegiality principle. Thanks, thanks to this collegiality principle, they act as a whole, as a college, and they take all the responsibility as a whole. The, the, the other side of this one that actually it's kind of the same principle, but translated not from, for the political level. You remember there were two levels, political level and bureaucratic level. The graduality principle refers to the political level, to the College of Commissioners that we talked about until now. The principle of administrative coherence is the same principle, but applied to the bureaucratic level, to the DGs and services. So all the services of the Commission actually make, an, make up one administrative body that decides as a whole. So it's really like the College, but applying to the bureaucratic uh, uh, body of the Commission. And we will see in a second internally how that works, that all the services have to be consulted if it's not one service or one DG that takes the, the decision for all of them. Uh, it's really, really important that you remember these two principles because that makes it easier to understand when you read in the media or when you, when you actually uh, uh, see things uh, or, or hear things about the Commission, how things actually work internally, that it's not one person responsible, it's always the college or always the entire bureaucratic body and not one DG. Uh, and now, for, for one or two slides, we will linger in between the political and the bureaucratic levels, just to confuse you even more, and then we'll switch completely to the bureaucratic level and we'll talk about the DGs and services. Uh, but for now, I will, again, stay on this kind of bridge in between. Uh, and um, what I mean by this is basically talking about the cabinets of the commissioners. Um, each commissioner has his or her own cabinet. And the cabinet um, is actually the, 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 the link of, um, it actually plays a very, very important role. It actually plays as a, as a bridge between the, the commissioner, the political level, and his DG, the bureaucratic level. Uh, it's made up by seven, eight people, and they actually, their main task, and they're very, very busy people, I can, I can assure you, they actually have to gather information and keep their commissioner informed about all the political developments. So let's say, for instance, you have commissioner for agriculture. He is supposed to be in charge of the agriculture sector, right? Uh, the agricultural policy of the, of the EU. However, because of the collegiality principle that we talked about a few slides ago, um, all decisions in all the fields have to, take, have to be taken by the whole college. So obviously every member of the college, so all the 27 commissioners, have to be informed, or at least at the, at the basic level, have to know about developments in all the other political fields. Now he as one person doesn't have, he or she doesn't have time to be informed or to, to know everything that's going on in the commission or all the policy initiatives that the commission is taking because they're quite a lot, I can, I can tell you. So then uh, the, uh, the cabinet acts as a filter, as an information gatherer and a filter for the commissioner about all these various policy developments. Uh, and uh, also it acts not only as an information filter, but also uh, as a liaison office with all the other parts of the commission, with the other commissioners, but also with the other DGs. And also tries if, if one commissioner, for example, uh, and one DG and, and his and his DG basically uh, come up with a policy, um, the policy proposal, or are, are working on a policy proposal, the cabinet is also because of this li liaising uh, um, uh, uh, feature uh, is the one that actually links to the other DGs, to the other services, and tries to build support for the specific policy proposal. Um, and also later on, uh, and we'll talk about that in order to slide, uh, within the decision-making process internally in the Commission, the Cabinet um, uh, uh, members will, will also be the one that will try to build agreements between the various uh, uh, Commission uh, services. Um, and that's not easy, that's not an easy task. They actually try to clean the path and to, to really reach agreements before issues are discussed by the Commissioners themselves. So they really play a very important role. The cabinet plays a very important role in bridging between the political level and the bureaucratic level, between the commissioner and his DG and all the other DGs. Um, now, what are the main roles of the commission, the main roles and responsibilities, and how does the commission function internally? First of all, I would just like to mention the four main roles of the commission. I'm just going through them, and then I will focus on the, on the first role, uh, which is the most important role, the one that uh, whereby the Commission has the monopoly of legislative um, uh, proposal. 
uh, of putting out legislative proposals. Um, and uh, of course, the other two are the other three are equally important. And I mean, I will uh, later on talk mostly about the fourth role representing the EU on international stage. Uh, but now I will also mention the second and the third one uh, uh, just briefly. Uh, so, beside the fact that it has the monopoly of of, of uh, putting out legislative proposals, so legislative monopoly that I'm going to talk about in the next slide, which is quite important. Um, the second, the second role is to actually manage and implement EU policies, and we're going to talk about that uh, um, uh, a little bit uh, later as well, uh, and also um, to enforce European law, and that it does together with the European Court of Justice, and I'll refer to that later on when we talk about the whole circle of, of uh, EU decision making, just as a preview for the next webinars. Um, but coming back to its main role that I mentioned before is that of uh, the, the, the legislative monopoly. It is very important. Why, why is this so important? First of all, you just have to imagine like this, the Commission has the pen and the paper. It has the power to draft the proposals. So, and it is the only institution that has the power to do that currently. And that, there is an exception to that, and that's foreign policy, and I mean, I will get back to that uh, later on. But mainly in the, all the public policy areas, uh, the Commission has the monopoly of putting out legislative proposals. And that's quite, quite a source of power, setting out the agenda. It, it's quite a source of power. And now, it does that in quite a um, um, complex manner. It's not that one person in one DG or one commissioner just wakes up all of a sudden and says, okay, I'm going to come up with this policy uh, or proposal or, or this other policy proposal. It, it doesn't happen like this. It's a bit more complex. Uh, and, and I'm going to explain that in a second. Um, but uh, one thing I want to mention beforehand is that even if it has this monopoly and it's quite a big power, it does have a few factors that constrain it. And these are the subsidiarity and the proportionality principles, as well as the legal basis. So first of all, in order to take, to, to come up with, <clears throat> with a legislative proposal, the Commission has to uh, obey a legal basis. It has to have a legal basis. It cannot um, come up with a proposal without a legal basis. And the Article 17 of the Treaty of the European Union actually uh, sets out what the Commission can uh, can do. Um, the subsidiarity and the proportionality principles, well, basically the subsidiarity principle states that the action has to be taken at the, the level closest to the citizens. That is translated in other words. But the idea is that the EU cannot take action where action can be taken in a better and a more efficient uh, efficient and effective way at another level, be it national level or sub-national level, local, regional, and so on. So the Commission really has to pay attention to that because this is quite, quite well monitored at the moment uh, uh, by the national parliaments. Uh, and I won't go into detail there, but if you have questions at the end, uh, that's quite an important aspect. Uh, the Commission cannot take um, um, action where it can be actually challenged and national parliaments can say, well, you should not act on that. It actually should, this actually should be done by, at the national level or the, even at the local level. Uh, so that the Commission really has to take into account and even uh, when it lays out its legislative proposal, it has to explain how that proposal and how that specific policy uh, is, what's the added value of doing it at the European level instead of the member state level or the local and national level. Um, the proportionality is linked to that. Uh, so basically, the EU, with its actions, should not go beyond what is strictly necess necessary to achieve the objectives set out in the treaty. So <laughs> it really goes together with the subsidiarity principle. Now, the Commission is kind of linked to these principles and to the legal basis, so it cannot do, uh, obviously, more than that. But that being said, it has quite a lot of power um, <clears throat> in setting out the agenda. Um, and how, how is that done? Um, as I said, that's quite a, quite a complex process. And without going too much into details, I just want to mention that um, the, the main steps that are taken within the Commission. So this, what you see on this slide is actually uh, a bit of internal kitchen of the European uh, Commission, something that you normally don't really see in the media because you only see it from the next step that I will talk about in, in a second. What is going on here is the drafting process of the legislative proposal. So the very, very, very first, first step of the process. And this is quite important to know what's going on at this, uh, at this level, also specifically for people that would like to lobby and influence uh, EU policymaking, uh, because that's where it all starts. 
and, and how does it start? It actually, for every legislative proposal, there is a lead DG. Uh, so a DG, <coughs> uh, a, a general director that is actually taking initiative. And that's usually the DG that is mostly linked to that topic, to that area, to that policy area. So if it's an environmental legislative proposal, it will be DG environment. How, so the, 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 the lead DG, the people in the lead DG are in charge of drafting the very first outline of the proposal. But they are not doing it alone. There is a very, very uh, strict uh, uh, official and uh, formal and more informal process of consulting. And the consulting takes place both internally within the commission, and I'll get back to that in a second, and externally with outside experts, uh, people from various sectors, private sector, NGOs, civil society, and so on. So you have on the one hand side internal consultation, <coughs> and the other hand side external consultation. Internal consultation, as I said, can be formal and can be mostly informal. So basically, you have the inter-service consultation, which is the the the, the formal um, the formal uh, procedure whereby the, the all the DGs that are linked or have an interest related to that policy area have to give their input. But before that, you have a lot of inter-service uh, groups that actually meet or discuss via via internet via emails um, about the proposal. So the, the the lead DG gets input from all the other uh, from all the other um, uh, DGs that have an interest in that proposal uh, beforehand. Also from the legal service, the legal service and the secretariat are there horizontally to monitor all the proposals and how they they go about. <clears throat> so that is the the, the way that the, the inter service consultation within the commission goes. As I said, remember before the the principle of administrative coherence. The, the DGs act as one body. It's not one DG taking a decision all by itself. It's a whole body that has to agree. So that is why the inter-service consultation takes place for. That's the internal consultation procedure. The external consultation procedure involves, as I said, uh, the various stakeholders. So the commission would ask for, for consultations either online or face-to-face -face in bringing everyone in a big room. People from various sectors, the private sector, uh, the sector is involved basically the sectors that have an interest in that in that specific area. So if it's a, again uh, an environmental proposal, <clears throat> they are likely to to involve uh, people from both NGOs, environmental NGOs that we know very well are quite vocal, and also from people uh, people from our manufacturer sector, for, for example. So industry, NGOs, everyone uh, is is consulted basically at that point, and that's quite important. That's really the first entry point for the people that want. To, in, is their job to influence EU, uh, EU policy making. Um, <clears throat> once the draft is agreed upon in the inter-service consultation, uh, it goes on to the cabinet. As I said, the cabinet tries to discuss it and smoothen the path for the commissioners to have less to discuss and, and just to, to, to agree on. Uh, but the very, very controversial issues that could not have been solved at the other levels, either at the bureaucratic level, DG level, or at the cabinet level, kind of diplomatic level, uh, they all land on the uh, table of the commissioners and they will have to discuss it within oral procedure. And they basically these are the, the topics that, that you hear about in the media because they are the ones actually discussed in the, in the, in the cabinet meetings that take place weekly. Uh, the rest is usually solved or sorted out and just rubber stamped by the commissioners, but it's actually sorted out beforehand in the meetings of the, the um, uh, heads of cabinets that take place <clears throat> the same week and the week before. And they are quite busy, as I as I mentioned. The second the the, the second um, uh, level, so that's the internal part. What happens within the commission? Now, what happens when the commission puts out the legislative proposal? <clears throat> the commission puts out the proposal and sends it to both Parliament and Council of Ministers. Of course, it sends it to other bodies as well. The um, uh, consultative committees, the Committee of the Region and the Economic and Social Committee, but that's something on the side. And it also sends it to national parliaments that will check, what will they check? The subsidiarity principle, the one we talked about just before. But that's something on the side. The important thing is that within the ordinary legislative procedure, before it was called co-decision, you probably know it as co-decision, the Commission puts out the proposal after going through all the process we talked about internally, and then it has to be jointly adopted by the European Parliament and the Council and then it becomes a legislative act, either a regulation or a directive or a decision. The proposal, as I said, comes from the Commission. That's the Commission's role. Uh, and then, um, um, just maybe this uh, scheme is going to explain it a bit better. Um, the idea is that, as I said, the Commission is on the top. It comes up with the proposal, then the Parliament and the Council co-legislate, adopt the legislative act, 
And the next step is that the, the, the implementation, obviously, what comes after the adoption of an act is implementation, and that takes place, that is done by the member states, essentially, in practice. Just because the Commission does not have the size, the resources, the power, not the power, but the resources to actually implement all the EU law, uh, all the EU legislation. So that is done at member states level, but the Commission is closely monitoring how the EU law is implemented, and it does that together with the European Court of Justice, whose role is basically to ensure that, that the EU law is rightly implemented and respected. So <clears throat> this is really important to know that the, 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 the whole process doesn't end when the Legislative Act is adopted by the Parliament and the, Consul, the uh, Council of Ministers jointly. And that will be talked about at large in our last uh, webinar at the end of the month and touched upon um, quite considerably in the webinars on European Parliament and the Council of the EU next two weeks. But that is followed by member states implementing it and, of course, Court of Justice keeping an eye that, 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 that the EU law is, is rightly and, and uh, rightly respect, implemented. Uh, and that basically is, is a scheme that just uh, makes you visualize what I've said before, uh, the whole process that goes on within the Commission and after uh, the legislative proposal goes out from the Commission. Um, just to summarize everything, uh, it, it's quite interesting for you to remember that the, the everyday work of the Commission, of the European Commission, could be characterized as multi-level, multicultural, and multitasking. So why multi-level? Well, it's just really a summary of what I've talked before. The, the Commission actually has to link, has, has to, to work at the various levels. First of all, at the level of EU institutions. It interacts with all the other EU institutions, as the scheme before just showed. It also has to act on the international and global level, and Amelia will talk about that in a second. Um, also, it has to interact a lot with member states that actually do the implementation of the EU law, and with the various stakeholders. As I said already from the preparatory stage, you ha they have to interact, and they interact, they consult a lot, the, the various stakeholders. And, of course, the, the inherent uh, uh, hierarchy uh, of, of the Commission, the DGs, the, the bureaucratic level and the political level, they also have to, to interact a lot. So they're really the, 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 um, the work of the Commission is done on various levels. <clears throat> Multicultural, why? That's self-explanatory. You, you have the Commission representing people, all the EU citizens uh, from 27 member states. You have currently 23 official languages. Basically, it's a, it's a really multicultural working environment. And we have a lot of well, people that work here considered expats, so people that work in Brussels and come from the various member states. It's quite a challenging and interesting working environment. Um, and multitasking, why multitasking? Well, as you could figure out, could have figured out already in the last task, they have, they have to, to, to do various types of tasks. There are quite specific ones linked to their policy area, <coughs> but they also have a lot of cross cutting a uh, task that touch upon, upon various areas. They have to consult upon uh, uh, making decisions of various areas. And also they have to under, uh, undertake a lot of administrative and financial tasks that comes with kind of every job. Uh, and they also, very important, have to undertake information and communication tasks toward the European citizens. So they have to answer the requests from European citizens. There are real policies regarding that. They have a specific time in which they can ask, they, they, they should answer uh, any any request from European citizens for documents or for, for specific answers. And of course, it has to interact a lot with the other two uh, with the other two uh, main institutions, the Parliament and the Council of Ministers, within the ordinary legislative procedure, as mentioned in the scheme before. So these these are really the, the Three important uh, things uh, to remember about the Commission. It has uh, a multi-level uh, kind of work, uh, uh, multitasking, and it's a very multicultural environment. And I think now I'm going to hand over to Amelia again to talk about, uh, to, to focus on the external role of the European Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. That was a, a whirlwind tour de force on the inner workings of one of the most complex institutions in the world. Um, I think, in a sense, nothing is, is, is more um, complex than, of course, the way in which the Commission interacts uh, with, with the outside. And this has always been um, a slightly uneasy uh, relationship, much of it dependent on what you mean by external affairs, because, of course, you can talk about traditional foreign policy in political terms or security terms. And both of these, of course, are areas that uh, member states prefer to have firmly within their sovereign remit. Equally, you can talk about uh, economic external affairs, 
like trade, like investment, like development. And these are areas which have been um, for a long, long time, at least trade and development, given over uh, not only to the, the community area, but the supranational competence dominated uh, by the managerial uh, expertise of the European Commission. So you immediately have a bipolar disorder to some degree in foreign policy between the economic heart of foreign policy that has for many, many years sat happily within the community, managed by the Commission, and the more traditional ideas of diplomacy, uh, political foreign policy and security, which have been, as I said before, firmly kept within the sovereign remit um, of the member states as well. So I think something to bear in mind is that um, the, the Commission certainly has a high degree of managerial and technocratic responsibility, um, particularly with, with regards to the budget line, as, as you'll see. Um, but it is not, at this point, um, a, 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 a major foreign policy player in traditional terms. But the one thing, of course, that we know about the Commission is, is that it's a desperately untraditional, a very unorthodox uh, international entity. So we shouldn't be surprised to see even the functional division of DGs and the particular policy profiles um, divided up in a way uh, in, in which we, we might find it uh, slightly, uh, slightly confusing, uh, slightly uh, anti-instinctive. So this slide here uh, makes very clear that with regards to uh, the common foreign and security policy, which is EU speak for foreign policy, um, the upper hand uh, continues, of course, uh, to be held uh, by the member states uh, within the workings of the European Council and after the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, dominated by the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy as well as the new Council President. There is, uh, in, in some sense, therefore, uh, a, a less clear role, perhaps a minor role of the European Commission and the European Parliament. Uh, at the same time, the European Parliament and the Commission have a clearer sense of these roles. So I would say that the jury is out to some degree as to whether Lisbon has cut the wings, clipped the wings of the European Commission or whether it has just made a little more clear what the Commission can do and with that clarity it does it better. Um, therefore, in these three sub points here, European Commission um, certainly can submit proposals uh, alongside, together with the High Representative, Baroness Catherine Ashton, uh, but it does not, unlike in many other policy areas, have the legislative initiative. It doesn't have the monopoly of initiative on foreign policy. It does, however, thanks to um, its uh, auditing accounting structure, uh, have the capacity also to manage the money, the CFSP budget line, um, and of course is fully involved um, in discussions and implementation to ensure uh, the coherence but also the consistency um, of policies on external affairs. Um, if you have uh, the Council and the Commission and also the, the bridging conduit, if you like, mm -hmm. of the High Representative, um, although some uh, uh, reinforcing mechanisms are present, there's a lot of overlap as well, which is, sometimes occurs uh, not necessarily um, in a good way. Um, and the impact can sometimes be felt in incoherent policies or the inconsistent implementation of policies. Um, this was certainly focused on um, with a degree of rigor by the Commission a few years ago in a document entitled Policy Coherence, which admits to some degree uh, not only that foreign policy is very difficult to do, but that the functional division of where policy is done, foreign policy is done between the institutions is not perfect. It's certainly imperfect. The European Parliament, I think, has a growing degree of scrutiny and consultation and participation on aspects of choices and interinstitutional meetings. Um, is not only regularly informed about CFSP developments, but um, can request um, particular um, and specific reports from external um, uh, experts in order to be quite sure that what the Commission is doing, or perhaps the EAS, is exactly um, the right thing, um, is functional and ordered and rational. So I think a key question there, of course, um, is where is the power, who has it, and why? Um, with regards to EU external action, of course, it's governed by um, the fairly forgetful, what's called the principle of, of conferral, i.e. the union can be an actor, can legally act, only to the extent that the treaty allows it to, that the treaty and European Union has specified objectives 
which must be done together, must be attained in common, and only to the extent that the member states allow it to happen. So the member states have to confer to an institution like the Commission particular key competences to it. They bequeath it effectively. Beyond that, the EU cannot go, not at the union level anyway, and certainly not within um, the institutional remit of the Commission. The EU, as I have here, is not authorized to legislate or act beyond its competences. So um, in, in, in very strong terms, therefore, the CFSP is not an EU competence, although the management of the CFSP is certainly um, attended to and structurally uh, forwarded by key supranational actors, including um, the European Commission. After Maastricht, and now with Lisbon, this delightful three-pillar architecture, which we relied on so heavily, has effectively collapsed. It's very difficult, I think, in a sense, to have these um, these uh, three pillars um, and to, to move beyond them, but I'm afraid we have to. Um, if you have a look at the little graph in front of you, you can see the areas of EU competence um, with regards to the policy area, notably the external policy area, and it moves from rock-tight exclusive competence on things which historically have been at the union level like competition, monetary policy, and trade, down to shared, coordinated, sort of looser and looser, supplemental um, areas where the union has less and less control, where the member states necessarily want to retain the greatest amount of information, right down to the very bottom, CFSP, specific provisions on the common foreign and security policy. And I think, uh, in a sense, this tells us very much that the member states continue uh, to remain interested in the orientation, the content, uh, the thrust of the way in which they engage with the world. But can they also do this in a way that makes the European Union um, also uh, a key political actor. Occasionally, um, that, that, that comes undone. So in terms of what the Commission does, um, you certainly see it not necessarily owning CFSP as a result of competence. Perhaps we see some management, but it's much more representation. So in, as we have with regards to the point here, the Commission represents the European Union in those areas of exclusive competence. So if I just go back one, you can see here this, this top line. This is the customs union, competition rules, monetary policy, um, common commercial policy, uh, conclusion of international agreements. That's a very key one, which I'll come to in a minute. So in all these areas, the commission is the lead negotiator. That's, the, what, that's what you see at international negotiations. You see the commission space in areas of exclusive competence. Commission representation, of course, um, is going to be uh, shared uh, between the Commission and the Member States uh, in powers of um, the following again. So if I flip back to uh, shared, you can see uh, this is the second line. So in shared competence areas like internal markets, social policy, et cetera, et cetera, um, here the Commission as a supranational entity has to work uh, concretely in a coordinated and collaborative fashion with the Member States uh, to, to hash out the inner workings of social policy, transport, energy as well. Um, this means that the Commission can lead to a degree, but it certainly must support and supplement the actions of, 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 of the Member States. Commission representation uh, here very much is therefore limited to specific EU programs um, and, and initiatives. Um, so just, just to make it very, very clear, therefore, in the area of CFSP, um, you have external representation uh, by two people, by the President of the European Council, Herman von Rompuy, and the High Representative. But the High Representative is a bridging post, it's not just merely a Council post. Um, in which uh, the Foreign Affairs Council is chaired uh, by Lady Ashton, but also um, Vice President of the Commission, effectively the, the Chief Commissioner for, for Foreign Affairs. So you have, this, you have this bridging structure, therefore, in which the Commission and the Commission's role with regards to external affairs and the Council is neatly brought together. Um, I, my personal opinion is that this is a very good thing, uh, a good um, organizational and, and structural development um, under Lisbon. It has just taken quite a while to put it sort of into uh, a practical operation. But in, in non-CFSP matters, which we'll see in a minute, um, external representation is ensured by the Commission. And here I'm talking about foreign economic policy, foreign economic policy, trade and development, and, and a variety of others. And to do this, the Commission draws on what we can typify as non-CFSP DGs. 
So here are the directorates general within the commission. On the left-hand side, you have um, the, the, the top five that are clearly within the remit of external affairs, development and trade, top and bottom being the most important as well, enlargement, Europe aid, cooperation office, and humanitarian aid. So these are core areas of foreign economic policy of the European Union reaching out in economic, sometimes also, of course, clearly political terms, but ostensibly economic terms managed by, owned by, the European Commission. Other areas which have um, economic and political implications with regards to foreign affairs are you would find on the right hand side. So any of these have a direct bearing on the external relations, the external affairs of the European Union via the European Commission. Um, it depends, I suppose, what you're interested in, uh, but for my money, I think some of the ones that leap out at me um, are climate change, uh, competition, particularly in these areas of fiscal austerity, Education and culture, it's a surprisingly small DG, uh, but it has an enormous impact, I think, with regards to translating the norms and values of the European Union far, far beyond its borders. Energy, and of course, environment, um, as well as a, a few more functional ones, like maritime affairs and transport. Areas of justice, liberty, and security, um, formerly um, um, JHA, of course, um, are very much, in a sense, at the very heart of, of EU, non-EU domains and terrains with regards to um, these uh, liberalization schemes, um, etc. So it is very clear, of course, that the Commission varies from one area to, to another. Um, there is a very clear procedural split, if I can put it this way, uh, between your traditional pillar two Maastricht view dominated by the member states, dominated by the Council, and everything else that doesn't fall within that pillar two, all the non-CFSP areas of external action, of which, as we can see if I go back, there is an enormous amount. In fact, there's far more foreign policy done within the non-CFSP domain, I would argue, than strictly traditional foreign policy. I think that that is shrinking, that domain, traditional foreign policy, possibly because the way in which we define it is, is, is shifting as well. So again, a very clear procedural split between who gets to continue to manage you know, high politics, if I could put it in incredibly um, brutal terms, and non-CFSP areas of external action. The Council and the European External Action Service oversee the CFSP policy. So they continue, I think, to be the, the traditional sources, the wellsprings of foreign policy, but the Commission oversees non-CFSP and manages the CFSP budget line. I think it's, it's, it's worth emphasizing that because if you look at the website, it's not particularly clear, first of all, what is foreign policy, um, and second, how, of course, it's managed. So again, you get the European External Action Service um, clearly on the lineup um, of, the, um, of, of the Commission DGs. I've also uh, put a, a snapshot um, of what the EES does um, in, in, in the chat room, and as, as you can see there, it maintains diplomatic relations with nearly all of the countries in the world. I think what's confusing is that the EES, while, while found to some extent you know, within um, the, the Commission, is very clearly now an agency separate uh, from the Commission um, and has a, a, a rather different remit than the original DG Relics had, a uh, much more extensive one in, in, in many, many ways. So if you look on the right-hand um, column uh, of this uh, graph, you can see that non-CFSP external relations have uh, a, a vital and a growing role um, at, at four particular areas, and in these areas you're going to see the, the European Commission active um, as a result of the particular structure designated to them under, under the treaty. President of the European Commission operating at a head of state level. At a ministerial level, you'll find the Commission engaging once again, either through the um, high representative or particular policy um, specific commissioners and self, um, perhaps trade or enlargement um, or humanitarian aid. At the administrative level, the Commission again um, is, is, is going to be swinging in, uh, particularly with regards to uh, functional services and also the EEAS. Um, and, of course, um, EU delegations at the level of the third countries, EU delegations now effectively folded in to the European External Action Service. Um, so, again, with the exception of, of the CFSP uh, strict, strictu sensu, 
Um, the Commission can ensure the Union's external representation. It has a right of initiative um, to conclude international agreements, not necessarily to kickstart them, um, again with the exception of the CFSP and this very tricky uh, job. You can sum it up in two words, but it's a great deal more tough than that, ensure consistency. There are six modes of external representation. I'm going to whip through these quite quickly. But I think it's worth bearing in mind that these are the areas in which you see the Commission abroad in the world. This is the external face of the Commission. First of all, uh, determining and conducting the EU's external trade relations. I think you, you can't go wrong uh, in terms of thinking of the, of the Commission's um, external face as largely preoccupied with, even now, with trade. Um, it's still um, the, the dominant trade actor. So at least with regards to Article 207, you're going to see the European Union in the face of the Commission um, acting in both formal negotiations, for example, in the World Trade Organization, and informal ones at the levels of summits or perhaps uh, ministry to ministry communications as well. Um, negotiating and managing uh, responsibilities uh, for special external agreements as well uh, with states and groups of states relating to trade. Uh, and financial aid and political dialogue. Um, here you have um, uh, sort of overlapping policies between EU and non-EU states, um, and they're a sort of a sandwich policy in, in which it, it, it starts off trying to kickstart free trade um, and has financial aid built into it. Uh, but a prime goal, of course, is to, to um, set up and retain political dialogue between an EU and a non-EU state. And the Commission has the the responsibility to negotiate and to continue to manage those relationships. The third one, of course, um, falls to the High Representative as Vice President of the Commission. She therefore represents the Commission's external face at the United Nations and its various agencies, at the Council of Europe, at the OSCE, and the OECD as well. More interestingly, and this is a very low-level one that I think kind of falls off the radar, the Commission is the key point of contact between the European Union and dozens and dozens of non-EU member states uh, around the world, um, 160 states, give or take, um, with diplomatic missions that are accredited to the European Union. So when they connect to the European Union, uh, they, they effectively need an info point, if you like, um, in order to find out what the latest um, status is with regards to legislation or forward looking policies, or they want information off the Commission, or they have information from their own perspective that they want to translate. The Commission is responsible for actually an inordinate amount of ever-changing paperwork in this sense, and for keeping other members informed of, of and for EU affairs. Um, a, a lot of this work um, has now subsumed within the EEAS, but it's also found um, a policy uh, specifically within the various DGs in terms of the function that they, uh, that they produce. The final two modes of representation that the Commission um, is responsible for overseeing um, applications for EU membership, a very contentious point now. Um, this is uh, certainly continues to be interesting, but fairly tortuous wrote of negotiating chapters, endless chapters of the acquis, um, and all the subsequent aspects of the accession process. Here, I think the Commission, um, if I can sit in judgment for a minute, has a very good reputation um, as, as a project manager. Um, I think the difficulties of a transformation and modernization and harmonization um, which the EU generally demands of accession states and, 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 and candidate status in general is fairly strictly managed by the Commission according to uh, a methodology that it has put to, together itself. Um, so much so, in fact, that I think the enlargement template uh, put together by DG Enlargement um, actually serve a, a double purpose, not only um, the, the methodology of transforming non-EU foreign affairs to EU, but also to acting um, as a platform to further foreign policies like the neighborhood policy um, templates in which the European Union continues to have a sort of enlargement light uh, policy with regards to North Africa. And Central and Eastern Europe. And finally, um, the, the Council, uh, the Commission is, is inherently supportive um, of common foreign and security policy and common security and defense policy, supportive um, in the sense um, of, of providing information and advice, um, secondary, of course, to the Council, to the prime architect there. But of course, through its main conduit of the high representative, it has a very effective uh, bridge in terms of wanting to steer the rationale behind a lot of these um, policies. Um, 
more importantly, I think many, many policies, particularly EU, non-EU um, um, connections with regards to a political dialogue and trade and investment, rely very, very heavily in order to be effective upon policy instruments which are inherently managed by the Commission, and those, of course, are trade um, and development. Um, so the, the method by which the European Union has always reached out to, to non-EU states for the purpose of contact, dialogue, transformation, modernization, um, has uh, for, for many, many years always been firmly grounded in trade, and if it's developing states, um, even more firmly grounded in, in, in development aid. And on top of that, you then get more traditional layers, if you like, of foreign and diplomatic um, um, concentration. And I, I think that those are only bound to be successful if the original um, economic layer um, is, is effective, and that's very much down to, down to the Commission as well. Here's a few snapshots of the types of international agreements that the Commission is going to have to manage it at, at any point, and it's quite staggering. 739 bilateral and 231 multilateral agreements uh, concluded so far, and the EU itself, of course, a member of um, 39 international organizations now with, a, with an upgraded status at the UN, um, something, of course, um, that the High Representative uh, manages. There, there's a website there that you can, you can check. So the, the role, I think, of managing um, relations with other states, managing international agreements, um, cannot be underestimated. It might sound like rather quiet and quotidian stuff, um, but the Commission certainly is responsible for, for an enormous amount of um, uh, d daily procedural uptake here, submitting recommendations to the Council, um, whereby the Council will act by, by, by QMV to allow the Commission to go back to open negotiations and to, to, to put together particular um, committees um, and to negotiate a particular agreement from the beginning um, to the end. I've therefore come to the end of the external relations snapshot. I'm going to want to focus um, on more on the external action service when we do the council because I think in terms of substance, um, foreign policy substance, it makes a little bit more sense to do it after we've seen uh, the foreign policy and intergovernmental dynamics that the council has. Um, at the same time, it's, it's, it must be absolutely clearly borne in mind that the European External Action Service um, has a large uh, DNA component, if you like, of the original DG relics um, of the Commission firmly, firmly with, with, within it. I think in a sense that's only settling down now. Um, there's two points I'd like to um, bring to your attention as we conclude. Helpful resources, of course. I'll do the second one first. Um, in terms of the Eurospeak, which you, uh, are, is very difficult to escape, especially in Brussels, helpful uh, online access is as EUABC, uh, in which uh, uh, the wide uh, and, and quite well-written glossary is available to you. And also the online modules, which we're very happy to provide here at the uh, Institute for European Studies, and I'll just give you this, this final slide here. They uh, allow you at your leisure to learn online with regards to um, the, the most important areas of the European Union, starting with its history, moving on to its key institutions like the Commission, which we've just looked at today, and then the, the rather ticklish area of European decision making, um, and then the area of European law, so very vital, I think, to, to undergird, undergirding our, our idea of um, the, the policy competence of the, of the Union, and of course EU information sources, where do you go to get the information you need to know. Um, these five online modules um, are, are things that you can be signed up for. Um, I think they're, they're offered uh, at a very uh, reasonable uh, price. Um, an interesting uh, new development, of course, is that now they are accredited. So um, if you take all five, um, you have uh, 20 uh, ECTS credits, and if you take it in tandem with the IES Summer School, which is another five, you um, are in possession of the postgraduate certificate on European Union policy making. We're finished now, therefore, the formal presentation, but we do have a few minutes remaining to take a Q&A uh, from people in the chat room, either in terms of uh, typing. Or if you'd like, as Alexander mentioned before, uh, to get yourself onto, onto video by, I think, by, by, by raising your hand. So I'm just looking now to see um, if anybody is uh, trying to get my attention. Um, I don't see any particular hands being raised. I'm just moving quietly down here. Um, I'm just also moving down the, the chat box here. I think 
in that case, everything has been answered. Um, I'm very pleased, therefore, to bring this um, first webinar to an end. It's going to be uh, available uh, permanently um, on, the, on the IES website um, within the overall structure of the, the decoding format. And we'll look forward to meeting up next week um, to um, tackle the, the second, the, um, the, the council um, of the four uh, webinar series. Thank you very much for attending today. Take care. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.